British bombs did their work well. These still pictures give some idea of the accuracy of the bombing and the terrific damage that was done to this French factory making war materials for Germany. Well over a mile in length, the Renault works are located in the heart of industrial Paris, so the RAF bombers had special orders to stick to the target area only. By coming down very low, the crews put their bombs just where they wanted them. Germany wants the spring offensive, Bomber Command are seeing that she gets it. Hundreds of air crew of Bomber Command would have attended briefings such as this, but instead of lasting about 30 seconds, as so often depicted in the movies, my briefings lasted 30 minutes or more. The target, the route, the weather, bomb loads, defences, radar. Now the navigator's work really begins. Oh, well, blokes, how are things going? Oh, not so bad. Hey, thanks, Skinner. You know this route, don't you? And the ground speed for the second leg is 209 miles an hour. Uh, 209 miles an hour in 10 minutes. Yes, that seems okay. You've got your target maps and all the gen on target identification, haven't you? Yeah, I'm all set. Yes, and mine's all buttoned up, thanks, Skipper. Okay. Has anyone got any questions? How about you, chaps? No, sir. No. All right, get your kit and be in the van in five minutes' time, will you? Why are we really going at last? Come on, Viner. Get cracking. Get stuff. Flying boots and clothing on. As Sterling is cold at 10,000 feet, electrically heated flying suits for the gunners. And now for the crew bus. Make sure you have a parachute, skate kit, currency, flask of coffee. And if you're a navigator, your sextant, Dalton DR computer and drawing instruments. And most important, on your watch, the correct time. Let's get 
138 magnetic. 138 magnetic it is. This is the story of a German serviceman, an RAF rear gunner, and a Sterling aircraft from number 214 squadron. In 1943, Paul Jung was stationed on a German gun and searchlight unit near Hanover. His great hobby was photography, so he was seldom seen without his Leica and movie camera. He not only photographed his pets and his pals, but also shot this 8mm film of his colleagues relaxing in their quarters with beer and cards. Mm -hmm. 
Unfortunately, their evening's entertainment is interrupted when the telephone warns of an air raid alert. RAF bombers are approaching. fire greets the flares from the pathfinders marking the aiming point for the heavies of the main force close behind. the Stirlings was 19-year-old rear gunner Jeff Parnell, who's busy these days editing The Turret, the official journal of the Air Gunners Association. He recalls a mission in September 1943 when everything seemed routine, but suddenly all hell broke loose. The youngers didn't see us and I hit him with a 10-second burst. It knocked off his cockpit hood and his fin and set him light. He dropped into the depths below and exploded, so I really was awake when I heard this brief rattling noise. Was it incendiaries falling on us from above, or a single upward firing gun of another attacker directly below us, or even a malfunction of our own aircraft? I never knew. We were doing our bombing run and a voice said, we're on fire. And the skipper answered quite unemotionally, get it extinguished and put it out then. I saw no fighters and I saw no flak when the aircraft went into a violent dive from which there was really no hope of recovery. We were doing 350 miles an hour, I'd reckon, when the starboard wing came off. With an enormous bang and a great mass of flame and sparks, I was half outside the aeroplane trapped by my feet when this happened. I knew we were all going to die, it didn't seem to matter very much and I wasn't afraid, although I thought it was a bit young to die at 19. Quite deliberately I pulled my parachute ripcord, the jerk was unbelievable and I ought to have been shredded into small pieces. Then moments later with the parachute scarcely opened, I was on the ground surrounded by flaming wreckage and exploding ammunition. I was thinking about burning my parachute when I saw a figure with the German helmet. I tried to escape by hobbling into a field, only to leave by the same gateway. It was a long and confusing night. It had been a busy night too for Paul Jung, but nonetheless he had managed to record much that had happened on his 8mm film. Dawn the next morning, he and a comrade were up early checking for damage and the wreckage of that fallen Sterling. This bomb carrier would have contained several dozen four-pound incendiaries, but on impact had burst open, sending some over quite a wide area. Paul collected several and stacked them neatly in a pile in front of his searchlight, now covered by a tarpaulin, before inspecting and filming the wreckage.
capture in the morning was almost inevitable. Strangely, by Luftwaffe man Paul Young, who provided these films and photographs. Before dispatching me to a prisoner of war camp, he posed me on the steps of the village post office for a few happy snaps. He then asked me for my address so that he could send me copies after the war. I sometimes wonder what was in his mind at that point. Who did he think was going to win? So in 1946, I was amazed when a bundle of photographs arrived, as promised, including one of our Sterling going down in flames. Then in 1974, Paul came over.